Chapter 11 After the meal was concluded, the captain said to the chief, Now, Hassan, we want to know how it was that you arrived at the nick of time to save my officers' lives. I had been watching for some days, the chief said quietly. When I heard that many chiefs had joined Sehai Pandash, I said, I must go and help my white brothers. But I dared not take many men away from here, and, as I had to hide, the fewer there were with me the better. So I came down into the forest near Sehai's town, and found the wood full of men. We had come down in sampans, so that I could send off messengers as might be required. One of these I sent down to you to warn you to be prepared for an attack. Other messengers I had sent before from here but they must have been caught and killed, for I had been watching closely when they found that I would not join against you. When my last messenger returned I was glad. I knew that you would be on your guard, and would not be caught treacherously. Two of my men were in the town when they began to fire on the ship, and I saw the town destroyed, and followed Sihai to the place where the six prahaus were lying, and crossed the creek, and lay down in the woods near the village on the other side, for I thought that something might happen. One of my men went down in the night, and brought me news that the ship was gone, as my messenger had told me that you had questioned him as to the other entrance to the creek. I felt sure that you had gone there. So I was not surprised when, just before daybreak, two guns were fired. We saw the fight, the sinking of two of their vessels, and the attack by the water pirates, and by the men of the Rajah and the chiefs with him, and I feared greatly that my friends would be overpowered. I sent one of my men down to the mouth of the creek to tell you how much aid was wanted, but he saw the ship steaming up as he went, and so came back to me. Then we heard the ship's great guns begin to fire, and soon all was quiet, where the fight had been going on. Then I saw the other four boats start. One of them sank before she was out of sight, and I soon heard that your ship had sunk another, and that two had got away. It was not for another two days that I learned where they were and then I heard that they had gone into a creek twenty miles away. There one had sunk, and the other had been joined by the two prahaus that had been far up the river. And I also learned that one of Sihai's men had gone into the village, and let himself be captured, so that he might guide the ship's boats to the place where, as they thought, they would find but one prahau, while three would be waiting for them. I was not sure where the exact place was, for there are many creeks, but with one of my men I rode in a sampan all night in hopes to arrive in time to warn the boats, but it was not till I heard the firing that I knew exactly where they were. When I got there the fighting was over, but one prow was escaped, and I learned from the men who had swum ashore that those that had been sunk that one of the English boats had been destroyed, and many men killed, but that two boats had gone down the creek again. It was also said that the white officers and the sailors had boarded the boat that had escaped, and had been all killed. I thought it best to follow the prow, so that I could send word to you where she was to be found. As there were many passengers, it was difficult to find her, and I should have lost her altogether had I not heard where Sihai was hiding, and guessed that she would go there. It was late when I arrived at the village. There one of my men learned that two young officers, who had been wounded, had been brought there, and that Sihai was sending word to you that, unless you gave him the conditions he asked, they would be put to death. I did not know whether to send down to you or to send up the river for help, but I thought the last was best, for if you came in boats then Sihai's men would hear you, and the officers would be killed. So I sent off my man with a sampan. I told him that he must not stop until he got here. He must tell them that all my men except fifty old ones who were to guard the village were to start in their canoes and paddle their hardest till they came within half a mile of the village, and he was to come back with them to guide them and I was to meet them. As the prahaus that had been up there were destroyed, the river was safe for them to descend. I said that they must be at the point I named last evening. They were two hours late, though they had paddled their hardest. As soon as they disembarked I led them to the spot, and the rest was easy. I knew that the prisoners who had been taken were my two friends, for I saw them on the deck of the prow, and glad indeed I was to be able to pay my debt to them. "'You have paid it indeed most nobly, Hassan,' the captain said, holding out his hand and grasping that of the chief, when, sentence by sentence, the story was translated to him. 
Little did we think, when you were brought on board the serpent, that your friendship would turn out to be of such value to us. There was now some discussion as to the proposed meeting of chiefs, and half an hour later a dozen small canoes started with invitations to the various chiefs to meet the captain at Hassan's Kampong, with assurances that he was ready to overlook their share in the attack on the ship, and be on friendly terms with them, and that the safety of each who attended was guaranteed whether he was willing to be on good terms with the English or not. Four days later the meeting took place in the newly erected hall. Ten or twelve of the chiefs attended, others, who had taken a leading part of Sihai's allies, did not venture to come themselves, but sent messages with assurances of their desire to be on friendly terms. A good deal of ceremonial was observed. The marines and blue jackets were drawn up in a long line before the hall, which was decorated with green boughs. A union jack waved from a pole in front of it. The chiefs were introduced by Hassan to the captain. The former then addressed them, rehearsing the service that the English had done to them by destroying the power of the tyrant, who had long been a scourge to his neighbors, and who intended without doubt to become master of the whole district. As a proof of the good will of the English toward the Malays, he related how the two English officers had leaped into the water to save his child, and how kindly he himself had been treated. Then the captain addressed them through the interpreter. He told them that he had only been sent up the river by the governor, in accordance with an invitation from Sihai, of whose conduct he was ignorant, to undertake the protectorate of his district, and that on learning his true character, he at once reported to the governor that the rajah was not a proper person to receive protection, as not only did he prevent trade and harass his neighbors, but was the owner of a number of piratical craft that often descended the river and plundered the coast. England, the captain went on, has no desire whatever to take under her protection any who do not earnestly desire it, and who are not willing in return to promote trade and keep peace with their neighbors, nor can she make separate arrangements with minor chiefs. It was only because she understood that Sihai ruled over a considerable extent of territory, and was all-powerful in this part, that his request was listened to. "'I shall shortly return down the river,' the captain said, "'and have no thought or intention of interfering in any way with matters here. I wish to leave on good terms with you all, and to explain to you that it is to your interest to do all in your power to further trade, both by sending down your products to the coast, and by throwing no hindrance in the way of the products of the highlands coming down the river.' charging at the utmost a very small toll upon each boat that passes up and down. It is in the interest of all of you, of the people of the hills and of ourselves, that trade should increase. Now that Sihai is dead and his people altogether dispersed and all his piratical craft destroyed, with the exception of the one captured by Hassan, there is no obstruction to trade, and you are free from the fear that he would one day eat you up. Be assured that there is nothing to be feared from us. You all know how greatly the states protected by us have flourished, and how wealthy their rajahs have become from the increase of cultivation and the secession of tribal wars. If in the future all the chiefs of this district should desire to place themselves under English protection, their request will be considered, but there is not the slightest desire on the part of the governor to assume further responsibility, and he will be well satisfied indeed to know that there is peace among the river tribes security for trade, and a large increase in the cultivation of the country and in its prosperity. There was a general expression of satisfaction and relief upon the face of the chiefs, as sentence by sentence the speech was translated to them, and one by one they rose after its conclusion, and expressed their hearty concurrence with what had been said. One of the chiefs said, We know that these wars do much harm, but if we quarrel, or if one ill-treats another, or encourages his slaves to leave him, or ravages his plantations, what are we to do? That I have thought of, the captain said. I have spoken with the chief Hassan, and he has agreed to remove with his people to the spot where Sehai's town stood. There, doubtless, he will be joined by Sehai's former subjects, who cannot but be well pleased at being rid of a tyrant who had forcefully taken them under his rule. He will retain the praho that he has taken, 
and will use it to keep the two rivers free of robbers. But in no other respect will he interfere with his neighbors. His desire is to cultivate the land, clear away the forest, and encourage his people to raise products that he can send down the river to trade with us. He will occupy the territory only as far as the creek that runs between the two rivers. I propose that all of you shall come to an agreement to submit any disputes that may arise between you to his decision, swearing to accept his judgment whichever way it may go. This is the way in which the disputes are settled in our country. Both sides go before a judge, and he hears their statements and those of their witnesses, and then decides the case. And even the government of the country is bound by his decision. I don't wish you to give me any reply as to this. I make the suggestion solely for your own good, and it is for you to talk it over among yourselves, and see if you cannot all come to an agreement that will put a stop to the senseless wars, and enable your people to cultivate the land in peace, and to obtain all the comforts that arise from trade. A boat had been sent down to the ship, and this returned with a number of the articles that had been put on board her as presents for Sehai and other chiefs. These were now distributed. A feast was then held, and the next morning the chiefs started for their homes, highly gratified with the result of the meeting. On the following day the British boats also took their way down the river, followed by the prow with a considerable number of Hassan's men, who were to clear away the ruins of Sehai's campong, to bury the dead still lying among them, and to erect huts for the whole community. The serpent remained for a week opposite the town, a considerable quantity of flour, sugar, and other useful stores being landed for the use of Hassan's people. Dr. Horsley was gladdened by Hassan's promise that his people should be instructed to search for specimens of birds, butterflies, and other insects, and that these should be treated according to his instructions, and should be from time to time, as occasion offered, sent down to him in large cases to Singapore. To the two midshipmen the chief gave Chris's of the finest temper. "'I have no presents to give you worthy of your acceptance,' he said, "'but you know that I shall never forget you, and always regard you as brothers. I intend to send twelve of my young men down to Penang, there to live for three years and learn useful trades from your people. The doctor has advised me also to send Bahai, and has promised to find a comfortable home for her, where she will learn to read and write your language, and many other useful things. It is hard to part with her, but it is for her good and that of her people. If you will write to me sometimes, she will read the letters to me, and write letters to you in return, so that, though we are away from each other, we may know that neither of us has forgotten the other. Bahai and twelve young Malays were taken to Penang in the Serpent, where the doctor found a comfortable home for her with some friends of his, to whom payment for her board and schooling was to be paid by Hassan in blocks of tin, which he would obtain from boats coming down from the hills, in exchange for other articles of trade. The Malays were placed with men of their own race belonging to the protected states, and settled as carpenters, smiths, and other tradesmen in Penang. Three years later, they and Baha'i were all taken back in the serpent to their home. The river was acquiring considerable importance from the great increase of trade. They found Hassan's town far more extensive and flourishing than it had been in the time of his predecessor. The forest had been cleared for a considerable distance round it. The former inhabitants had returned, tobacco, sugar-cane, cotton, pepper, and other crops whose products were useful for trade purposes were largely cultivated, while orchards of fruit-trees had been extensively planted. Hassan reported that tribal wars had almost ceased, and that disputes were in almost all cases brought for his arbitration. Owing to the abolition of all oppressive tolls, trade from the interior had very largely increased. A great deal of tin, together with spices and other products, now finding their way down by the river. Hassan was delighted with the progress Baha'i had made, and ordered that three or four boys should at once be placed for instruction under each of the men who had learned trades at Penang. There was much regret on both sides when the serpent again started down the river, for it was known that she would not return, as in a few months she would be sent to a Chinese station, and from there would go direct to England. The composition of her crew was already somewhat changed, Lieutenant Ferguson had received his promotion for the fight with the prows, and had been appointed to the command of a gunboat whose captain had been invalided home. 
Lieutenant Hopkins was now the Serpent's first lieutenant, and Morrison was second. Harry Parkhurst was third lieutenant, Dick Balderson, to the regret of both, having left the ship on his promotion, and having been transferred as third lieutenant to Captain Ferguson's craft. Both have since kept up a correspondence with Bahai, who has married a neighboring chief, and who tells them that the river is prospering greatly, and that, although he assumes no authority, her father is everywhere regarded as the paramount chief of the district. From time to time each receives chests filled with spices, silks, and other Malay products, and sends back in return European articles of utility to the Rajah, for such is the rank that Hassan has now acquired on the river. End of chapter 11, and end of the series of chapters Among Malay Pirates, by Bears and Dacoits, A Tale of the Cats, by G. A. Henty. Chapter 1. A merry party was sitting in the veranda of one of the largest and handsomest bungalows of Pune. It belongs to Colonel Hastings, colonel of a native regiment stationed there, and at present, in virtue of seniority, commanding a brigade. Tiffin was on, and three or four officers and four ladies had taken their seats in the comfortable cane lounge chairs, which form the invariable furniture of the veranda of a well-ordered bungalow. Permission had been duly asked and granted by Mrs. Hastings, and the cheroots had just begun to draw, when Miss Hastings, a niece of the colonel, who had only arrived the previous week from England, said, "'Uncle, I'm quite disappointed. Mrs. Lyons showed me the bear she'd got tied up in her compound, and it's the most wretched little thing, not bigger than Rover, Papa's retriever, and it's full-grown. I thought bears were great fierce creatures, and this poor little thing seemed so restless and unhappy that I thought it quite a shame not to let it go.' Colonel Hastings smiled rather grimly. And yet, small and insignificant as that bear is, my dear, it's a question whether he is not as dangerous an animal to meddle with as a man-eating tiger. What? That wretched little bear, uncle? Yes, that wretched little bear. Any experienced sportsman will tell you that hunting those little bears is as dangerous a sport as tiger hunting on foot, to say nothing of tiger hunting from an elephant's back, in which there is scarcely any danger whatever. I can speak feelingly about it, for my career was pretty nearly brought to an end by a bear, just after I entered the army some thirty years ago, at a spot within a few miles from here. I've got the scars on my shoulder and arm still. Oh, do tell me all about it, Miss Hastings said, and the request being seconded by the rest of the party, none of whom, with the exception of Mrs. Hastings, had ever heard the story before, for the colonel was a somewhat chary of relating his special experience. He waited till they had all drawn up their chairs as close as possible, and then, giving two or three vigorous puffs at his cheroot, began as follows. Thirty years ago, in 1855, things were not as settled in the Deccan as they are now. There was no idea of insurrection on a large scale, but we were going through one of those outbreaks of decoity which have several times proved so troublesome. Bands of marauders kept the country in confusion, pouring down on a village, now carrying off three or four of the Bombay money-lenders, who were then, as now, the curse of the country, sometimes making an onslaught upon a body of traders, and occasionally venturing to attack small detachments of troops or isolated parties of police. They were not very formidable, but they were very troublesome and most difficult to catch, for the peasantry regarded them as patriots, and aided and shielded them in every way. The headquarters of these gangs of dacoits were the Ghats. In the thick bush and deep valleys and gorges, there they could always take refuge, while sometimes the more daring chiefs converted these detached peaks and masses of rock, numbers of which you can see as you come up the Ghat by railway, into almost impregnable fortresses. Many of these masses of rock rise as sheer up from the hillside as walls of masonry, and look at a short distance like ruined castles. Some are absolutely inaccessible, others can only be scaled by experienced climbers, and, although possible for the natives with their bare feet, are impracticable to European troops. Many of these rock fortresses were at various times the headquarters of famous dacoit leaders, 
and unless the summits happened to be commanded from some higher ground within gunshot range, they were all but impregnable, except by starvation. When driven to bay, these fellows would fight well. Well, about the time I joined, the dacoits were unusually troublesome. The police had a hard time of it, and almost lived in the saddle, and the cavalry were constantly called up to help them, while detachments of infantry from the station were under canvas at several places along the top of the ghats, to cut the bands off from their strongholds, and to aid, if necessary, in turning them out of their rock fortresses. The natives in the valleys at the foot of the ghats, who have always been a semi-independent race, ready to rob whenever they saw a chance, were great friends with the dacoits, and supplied them with provisions whenever the hunt on the Deccan was too hot for them to make raids in that direction. This is a long introduction, you'll say, and does not seem to have much to do with bears, but it is really necessary, as you will see. I had joined about six months when three companies of the regiment were ordered to relieve a wing of the 15th, who'd been under canvas at a village some four miles to the north of the point where the line crosses the top of the Ghats. There were three white officers, and little enough to do, except when a party was sent off to assist the police. We had one or two brushes with the dacoits, but I was not out on either occasion. However, there was plenty of shooting and a good many pigs about, so we had very good fun. Of course, as a raw hand, I was very hot for it, and as the others had both passed at the enthusiastic age, except for pig-sticking and big game, I could always get away. I was supposed not to go far from camp, because in the first place I might be wanted, and in the second because of the dacoits. And Norworthy, who was in command, used to impress upon me that I ought not to go beyond the sound of a bugle. Of course we both knew that if I intended to get any sport I must go further afoot than this, but I merely used to say, All right, sir, I will keep an ear to the camp and he on his part never considered it necessary to ask where the game which appeared on the table came from. But in point of fact I never went very far, and my servant always had instructions which way to send for me if I was wanted. While as to the dacoits, I did not believe in their having the impudence to come in broad daylight within a mile or two of our camp. I did not often go down the face of the ghats. The shooting was good, and there were plenty of bears in those days but it needed a long day for such an expedition, and in view of the dacoits, who might be scattered about, was not the sort of thing to be undertaken, except with a strong party. Norworthy had not given any precise orders about it, but I must admit that he said one day, "'Of course you won't be fool enough to think of going down the gaps, Hastings.' But I did not look at that as the equivalent to a direct order. <laughs> Whatever I should do now, Colonel put in, on seeing a furtive smile on the faces of his male listeners. However, I never meant to go down, though I used to stand on the edge and look longingly down into the bush, and fancy I saw bears moving about in scores. But I didn't think I should have gone into their country if they had not come into mine. One day the fellow who always carried my spare gun or flask, and who was a sort of shikari in a small way, told me he had heard that a farmer, whose house stood near the edge of the ghats some two miles away, had been seriously annoyed by his fruit and corn being stolen by bears. I said, I'll go and have a look at the place to-morrow. There is no parade, and I can start early. You may as well tell the mess-cook to put up a basket with some tiffin and a bottle of claret, and get a boy to carry it over. The bears not come in day, Raman said. Of course not, I replied. Still, I may like to find out which way they come. Just do as you're told. The next morning, at seven o'clock, I was at the farmer's, spoken of, and there was no mistake as to the bears. A patch of Indian corn had been ruined by them, and two dogs had been killed. The native was in a terrible state of rage and alarm. He said that on moonlight nights he had seen eight of them, and they came and sniffed around the door of the cottage. "'Well, why don't you fire through the window at them?' I asked scornfully, for I had seen a score of tame bears in captivity, and, like you, Mary, was inclined to despise them, though there was far less excuse for me, for I had heard stories which should have convinced me that, small as he is, the Indian bear is not a beast to be attacked with impunity. A 
Upon walking to the edge of the ghats there was no difficulty in discovering the route by which the bears came up to the farm. For a mile to the light and left the ground fell away as if cut with a knife, leaving a precipice of over a hundred feet sheer down, but close by where I was standing was the head of a watercourse, which in time had gradually worn a sort of cleft in the wall, up or down, which it was not difficult to make one's way. Further down this little gorge widened out and became a deep ravine, and further still a wide valley, where it opened upon the flats far below us. About half a mile down, where the ravine was deepest and darkest, was a thick clump of trees and jungle. I asked Raman, "'That's where the bears are?' He nodded. "'It seems no distance. I could get down and back in time for Tiffin, and perhaps bag a couple of bears.' For a young sportsman the temptation was great. How long would it take us to go down and have a shot or two at them? No good go down, master. Come here at night, shoot bears when they come up. I had thought of that, but in the first place it did not seem much sport to shoot the beasts from cover when they were quietly eating, and in the next place I knew that Norworthy could not, even if he were willing, give me leave to go out of camp at night. I waited, hesitating for a few minutes, and then I said to myself, It is of no use waiting. I could go down and get a bear and be back again while I am thinking of it. Then to Raman, No, come along. We'll have a look through that wood anyhow. Raman evidently did not like it. Not easy. Find bear, Sahib. He very cunning. Well, very likely we shan't find him, I said. But we can try anyhow. Bring that bottle with you. The tiffin basket can wait here till we come back. In another five minutes I had begun to climb down the watercourse, the shikari following me. I took the double-barreled rifle and handed him the shotgun, having first dropped a bullet down each barrel over the charge. The ravine was steep, but there were bushes to hold on by, and although it was hot work and took a good deal longer than I expected, we at last got down to the place which I had fixed upon as likely to be the bear's home. "'Sahib, climb up top,' Raman said. "'Come down through wood.' No good fire at bear when he above. I had heard that before, but I was hot, the sun was pouring down, there was not a breath of wind, and it looked a long way up to the top of the wood. Give me the claret. It would take too long to search the wood regularly. We'll sit down here for a bit, and if we can see anything moving up in the wood, well and good. If not, we'll come back again another day with some beaters and dogs. So saying, I sat down with my back against a rock at a spot where I could look up among the trees for a long way through a natural vista. I had a drink of the claret, and then I sat and watched till gradually I dropped off to sleep. I don't know how long I slept, but it was some time, and I woke up with a sudden start. Raman, who had, I fancy, been asleep too, also started up. The noise which had aroused us was made by a rolling stone striking a rock, and looking up I saw some fifty yards away, not in the wood, but on the rocky hillside on our side of the ravine, a bear, standing as though unconscious of our presence, snuffing the air. As was natural, I seized my rifle, cocked it, and took aim, unheeding a cry of, No, no, Sahib, from Raman. However, I was not going to miss such a chance as this, and I let fly. The beast had been standing sideways to me, and as I saw him fall, I felt sure I had hit him in the heart. I gave a shout of triumph, and was about to climb up, when, from behind the rock on which the bear had stood, appeared another, growling fiercely. On seeing me, it at once prepared to come down. Stupidly, taken by surprise and being new at it, I fired at once at its head. The bear gave a spring, and then, it seemed instantaneously, down it came at me. Whether it rolled down, or slipped down, or ran down, I don't know but it came almost as if it had jumped straight at me. "'My gun, Raman!' I shouted, holding out my hand. There was no answer. I glanced round and found that the scoundrel had bolted. I had time, and only just time, to take a step backwards and to club my rifle when the brute was upon me. I got one fair blow at the side of its head, a blow that would have smashed the skull of any civilized beast into pieces, and which did fortunately break the brute's jaw. Then, in an instant, he was upon me, and I was fighting for life. My hunting-knife was out, and with my left hand I had the beast by the throat, 
while with my right I tried to drive my knife into its ribs. My bullet had gone through his chest. The impetus of his charge had knocked me over, and we rolled on the ground, he tearing with his claws at my shoulder and arm, I stabbing and struggling, my great effort being to keep my knees up so as to protect my body with them from his hind claws. After the first blow with his paw, which laid my shoulder open, I did not think I felt any special pain whatever. There was a strange faint sensation, and my whole energy seemed centered in the two ideas, to strike and to keep my knees up. I knew that I was getting faint, but I was dimly conscious that his efforts, too, were relaxing. His weight on me seemed to increase enormously, and the last idea that flashed across me was that it was a drawn fight. The next idea of which I was conscious was that I was being carried. I seemed to be swinging about, and I thought I was at sea. Then there was a little jolt and a sense of pain. Oh, a collision, I muttered, and opened my eyes. Beyond the fact that I seemed in a yellow world, a bright orange yellow, my eyes did not help me, and I lay vaguely wondering about it all, till the rocking ceased. There was another bump, and then the yellow world seemed to come to an end, and as the daylight streamed in upon me I fainted again. This time, when I awoke to consciousness, things were clearer. I was stretched by a little stream. A native woman was sprinkling my face and washing the blood from my wounds, while another, who had with my own knife cut off my coat and shirt, was tearing the latter into strips to bandage my wounds. The yellow world was explained. I was lying on the yellow robe of one of the women. They tied the ends together, placed a long stick through them, and carried me in the bag-like hammock. They nodded to me when they saw I was conscious and brought water in a large leaf and poured it into my mouth. Then one went away for some time and came back with some leaves and bark. These they chewed and put on my wounds, bound them up with strips of my shirt, and then again knotted the ends of the cloth and lifting me up went on as before. I was sure that we were much lower down the gap than we had been when I was watching for the bears, and we were now going still lower. However, I knew very little Hindustani, nothing of the language the women spoke. I was too weak to stand, too weak even to think much, and I dozed and woke and dozed again, until, after what seemed to me many hours of travel, we stopped again, this time before a tent. Two or three old women and four or five men came out, and there was great talking between them and the young women, for they were young, who had carried me down. Some of the party appeared angry, but at last things quieted down, and I was carried into the tent. I had fever and was, I suppose, delirious for days. I afterwards found that for fully a fortnight I had lost all consciousness. But a good constitution and the nursing of the women pulled me round. When once the fever had gone, I began to mend rapidly. I tried to explain to the women that if they would go up to the camp and tell them where I was, they would be well rewarded, but although I was sure they understood, they shook their heads, and by the fact that, as I became stronger, two or three armed men always hung about the tent, I came to the conclusion that I was a sort of prisoner. This was annoying, but did not seem serious. These people were dacoits, or, as was more likely, allies of the dacoits. I could be kept only for ransom or exchange. Moreover, I felt sure of my ability to escape when I got strong, especially as I believed that in the young women who had saved my life, both by bringing me down and by their careful nursing, I should find friends. "'Were they pretty, Uncle?' Mary Hastings broke in. "'Never mind whether they were pretty, Mary. They were better than pretty.' "'No, but we like to know, Uncle.' "'Well, except the soft dark eyes common to the race.' and the good temper and light-heartedness also so general among Hindu girls, and the tenderness which women feel toward a creature whose life they have saved, whether it's a wounded bird or a drowning puppy, I suppose they were nothing remarkable in the way of beauty. But at the time, I know what I thought of them. Charming. End of chapter 1 Bears and Dacoits A Tale of the Gats by G. A. Henty this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Harris. Chapter 2 Just as I was getting strong enough to walk, and was beginning to think of making my escape, a band of five or six fellows armed to the teeth came in, and made signs that I was to go with them. It was evidently an arranged thing. The girls only were surprised. But they were at once turned out, and as we started, I could see two crouching figures in the shade with their clothes over their heads. I had a native garment thrown over my shoulders, and in five minutes after the arrival of the fellows found myself on my way. It took us some six hours before we reached our destination, which was one of those natural rock citadels. Had I been in my usual health, I could have done the distance in an hour and a half, but I had to rest constantly, and was finally carried rather than helped up. I had gone not unwillingly, for the men were clearly by their dress, dacoits at the deckhand, and I had no doubt that it was intended either to ransom or exchange me. At the foot of this natural castle were some twenty or thirty more robbers, and I was led to a rough sort of arbor, in which was lying on a pile of maize straw, a man who was evidently their chief. He rose, and we exchanged salams. "'What is your name, Sahib?' he asked in Maratha. "'Hastings, Lieutenant Hastings,' I said, and yours. "'Sevache Pont,' he said. Now this was bad. I had fallen into the hands of the most troublesome, most ruthless, and most famous of the dacoit leaders. Over and over again he had been hotly chased, but had always managed to get away. And when I last heard anything of what was going on, four or five troops of native police were scouring the country after him. He gave an order which I did not understand, and a wretched Bombay writer, I suppose a clerk of some money-lender, was dragged forward. Sivaji Pont spoke to him for some time, and the fellow then told me in English that I was to write at once to the officer commanding the troops, telling him that I was in his hands and should be put to death directly he was attacked. "'Ask him,' I said, "'if he will take any sum of money to let me go.' Shivaji shook his head very decidedly. A piece of paper was put before me, and a pen and ink, and I wrote as I had been ordered, adding, however, in French, that I had brought myself into my present position by my own folly, and would take my chance, for I well knew the importance which government attached to Sivaji's capture. I read out loud all that I had written in English, and the interpreter translated it. Then the paper was folded, and I addressed it. The officer commanding, and I was given some chupatis and a drink of water, and allowed to sleep. The dacoits had apparently no fear of any immediate attack. It was still dark, although morning was just breaking, when I was awakened and was got up to the citadel. I was hoisted rather than climbed, two men standing above with a rope tied round my body, so that I was half hauled, half pushed up the difficult places, which would have taxed all my climbing powers had I been in health. The height of this mass of rock was about a hundred feet. The top was fairly flat with some depressions and risings, and about eighty feet long by fifty feet wide. It had evidently been used as a fortress in ages past. Along the side facing the hill were the remains of a rough wall. In the center of a depression was a cistern some four feet square, lined with stonework, and in another depression a gallery had been cut, leading to a subterranean storeroom or chamber. This natural fortress rose from the face of the hill at a distance of a thousand yards or so from the edge of the plateau, which was fully two hundred feet higher than the top of the rock. In the old days it would have been impregnable, and even at that time it was an awkward place to take, for the troops were armed only with brown bess and rifled cannon were not thought of. Looking round I could see that I was some four miles from the point where I had descended, the camp was gone, but running my eye along the edge of the plateau, I could see the tops of tents a mile to my right, and again two miles to my left. Turning round and looking into the wide valley, I saw a regimental camp. It was evident that a vigorous effort was being made to surround and capture the dacoits, since troops had been brought up from Bombay. In addition to the troops above and below, there would probably be a strong police force acting on the face of the hill. 
I did not see all these things at the time, for I was, as soon as I got to the top, ordered to sit down behind the parapet. A fellow armed to the teeth squatting down by me, and signifying that if I showed my head above the stones, he would cut my throat without hesitation. There were, however, sufficient gaps between the stones to allow me to have a view of the crest of the gap, while below my view extended down to the hills behind Bombay. It was evident to me now why the dacoits did not climb up into the fortress. There were dozens of similar crags on the face of the gaps, and the troops did not as yet know their whereabouts. It was a sort of blockade of the whole face of the hills which was being kept up, and there were probably enough several bands of dacoits lurking in the jungle. There were only two guards and myself on the rock plateau. I discussed with myself the chances of my overpowering them and holding the top of the rock till help came, but I was greatly weakened and not a match for a boy, much less for the two stalwart Marathas. Besides, I was by no means sure that the way I had been brought up was the only possible path to the top. The day passed off quietly. The heat on the bare rock was frightful, but one of the men, seeing how weak and ill I really was, fetched a thick rug from the storehouse, and with the aid of a stick made a sort of a lean-to against the wall, under which I lay sheltered from the sun. Once or twice during the day I heard a few distant musket shots, and once a sharp, heavy outburst of firing. It must have been three or four miles away, but it was on the side of the gap, and showed that the troops or police were at work. My guards looked anxiously in that direction, and uttered sundry curses. When it was dark, Sivaji and eight of the dacoits came up. From what they said, I gathered that the rest of the band had dispersed, trusting either to get through the line of their pursuers, or, if caught, to escape with slight punishment. The men who remained, being too deeply concerned in murderous outrages to hope for mercy. Sivaji himself handed me a letter which the man who had taken my note had brought back in reply. Major Knapp, the writer, who was the second in command, said that he could not engage the government, but that if Lieutenant Hastings was given up, the act would certainly dispose the government to take the most merciful view possible but that if, on the contrary, any harm was suffered by Lieutenant Hastings, every man taken would be at once hung. Sivaji did not appear put out about it. I did not think he expected any other answer, and imagined that his real object in writing was simply to let them know that I was a prisoner, and so enable him the better to paralyze the attack upon a position which he no doubt considered all but impregnable. I was given food, and was then allowed to walk as I chose upon the little plateau, two of the dacoits taking post as sentries at the steepest part of the path, while the rest gathered, chatting and smoking, in the depression in front of the storehouse. It was still light enough for me to see for some distance down the face of the rock, and I strained my eyes to see if I could discern any other spot at which an ascent or descent was possible. The prospect was not encouraging. At some places the face fell sheer away from the edge, and so evident was the impracticability of escape that the only place which I glanced at twice was the western side, which is the one away from the hill. Here it sloped gradually for a few feet. I took off my shoes and went down to the edge. Below some ten feet was a ledge, on to which with care I could get down, but below that was a sheer fall of some fifty feet. As a means of escape it was hopeless, but it struck me that if an attack was made I might slip away and get on to the ledge. Once there I could not be seen except by a person standing where I now was, just on the edge of the slope, a spot to which it was very unlikely that any one would come. The thought gave me a shadow of hope, and returning to the upper end of the platform I lay down, and in spite of the hardness of the rock was soon asleep. The pain of my aching bones woke me up several times, and once, just as the first tinge of dawn was coming, I thought I could hear movements in the jungle. I raised myself somewhat, and I saw that the sounds had been heard by the dacoits, for they were standing, listening, and some of them were bringing spare firearms from the storehouse in evident preparation for attack. As I afterwards learned, the police had caught one of the dacoits trying to effect his escape and by means of a little of the ingenious torture to which the Indian police then frequently resorted, when their white officers were absent, 
they obtained from him the exact position of Sivaji's band, and learned the side from which the ascent must be made. That the dacoit and his band were still upon the slopes of the ghats they knew, and were gradually narrowing the circle, but there were so many rocks and hiding-places that the process of searching was a slow one, and the intelligence was so important that the news was off at once to the colonel, who gave orders for the police to surround the rock at daylight, and to storm it if possible. The garrison was so small that the police were alone ample for the work, supposing that the natural difficulties were not altogether insuperable. Just at daybreak there was a distant noise of men moving in the jungle, and the dacoit halfway down the path fired his gun. He was answered by a shout and a volley. The dacoits hurried out from the chamber and lay down on the edge, where, sheltered by a parapet, they commanded the path. They paid no attention to me, and I kept as far away as possible. The fire began, a quiet, steady fire, a shot at a time, and in strong contrast to the rattle kept up from the surrounding jungle. But every shot must have told, as man after man who strove to climb that steep path fell. It lasted only ten minutes, and then all was quiet again. The attack had failed, as I knew it must do, for two men could have held the place against an army. A quarter of an hour later a gun from the crest above spoke out, and a round-shot whistled above our heads. Beyond annoyance, an artillery fire could do no harm, for the party could be absolutely safe within the store cave. The instant the shot flew overhead, however, Sivaji Punt beckoned to me and motioned me to take my seat on the wall facing the guns. Hesitation was useless, and I took my seat with my back to the dacoits and my face to the hill. One of the dacoits, as I did so, pulled off the native cloth with co which covered my shoulders, in order that I might be clearly seen. Just as I took my place another round shot hummed by, but then there was a long interval of silence. With a field-glass every feature must have been distinguishable to the gunners, and I had no doubt that they were waiting for orders as to what to do next. I glanced round and saw that with the exception of one fellow squatted behind the parapet some half-dozen yards away, clearly as a sentry to keep me in place, all the others had disappeared. Some, no doubt, were on sentry down the path, the others were in the store beneath me. After half an hour's silence the gun spoke out again. Evidently the gunners were told to be as careful as they could, for some of the shots went wide of the left, others on the right. A few struck the rock below me. The situation was not pleasant, but I thought that at a thousand yards they ought not to strike me, and I tried to distract my attention by thinking out what I should do under every possible contingency. Presently I felt a crash and a shock, and fell backwards to the ground. I was not hurt, and on picking myself up saw that the ball had struck the parapet to the left, just where my guard was sitting, and he lay covered with its fragments. His turban lay some yards behind him. Whether he was dead or not I neither knew nor cared. I pushed down some of the parapet where I had been sitting, dropped my cap on the edge outside so as to make it appear that I had fallen over, and then, picking up the man's turban, ran to the other end of the platform and scrambled down to the ledge. Then I began to wave my arms about, I had nothing on above the waist, and in a moment I saw a face with a uniform cap peer out through the jungle, and a hand was waved. I made signs to him to make his way to the foot of the perpendicular wall of rock beneath me. I then unwound the turban, whose length was, I knew, amply sufficient to reach to the bottom, and then looked round for something to write on. I had my pencil still in my trousers' pocket, but not a scrap of paper. I picked up a flattish piece of rock and wrote on it, Get a rope ladder quickly, I can haul it up. Ten men in garrison, they are all under cover. Keep on firing to distract their attention. I tied the stone to the end of the turban and looked over. A non-commissioned officer of the police was already standing below. I lowered the stone, he took it, waved his hand to me, and was gone. An hour passed, it seemed an age, the round shots still rang overhead, and the fire was now much more heavy and sustained than before. Presently I again saw a movement in the jungle, and Norworthy's face appeared, and he waved his arm in greeting. Five minutes more and a party were gathered at the foot of the rock, and a strong rope was tied to the cloth. I pulled it up. 
a rope ladder was attached to it, and the top rung was in a minute or two in my hands. To it was tied a piece of paper with the words, Can you fasten the ladder? I wrote on the paper, No, but I can hold it for a light weight. I put the paper with a stone in the end of the cloth and lowered it again. Then I sat down, tied the rope round my waist, got my feet against two projections, and waited. There was a jerk, and then I felt someone was coming up the rope ladder. The strain was far less than I expected, but the native policeman who came up first did not weigh half as much as an average Englishman. There were now two of us to hold. The officer in command of the police came up next, then Norworthy, then a dozen more police. I explained the situation, and we mounted to the upper level. Not a soul was to be seen. Quickly we advanced and took up a position to command the door of the underground chamber, while one of the police waved a white cloth from his bayonet as a signal to the gunners to cease firing. Then the police officer hailed the party within the cave. Sivaji Punt, you may as well come out and give yourself up. We are in possession, and resistance is useless. A yell of rage and surprise was heard, and the dacoits, all desperate men, came bounding out, firing as they did so. Half of their number were shot down at once, and the rest, after a short, sharp struggle, were bound hand and foot. That's pretty well all of the story, I think. Sivaji Punt was one of the killed. The prisoners were all either hung or imprisoned for life. I escaped my blowing up for having gone down the ghats after the bear, because, after all, Sivaji Punt might have defied their force for months had I not done so. It seemed that that scoundrel Raman had taken back word that I was killed. Norworthy had sent down a strong party who found the two dead bears, and who, having searched everywhere without finding any signs of my body, came to the conclusion that I had been found and carried away, especially as they ascertained that natives used that path. They had offered rewards, but nothing was heard of me till my note saying I was in Sivaji's hands arrived. And did you ever see the women who carried you off? No, Mary, I never saw them again. I did, however, after immense trouble, succeed in finding out where it was that I had been taken to. I went down at once, but found the village deserted. Then, after much inquiry, I found where the people had moved to, and sent messages to the women to come up to the camp, but they never came and I was reduced at last to sending them down two sets of silver bracelets, necklaces, and bangles, which must have rendered them the envy of all the women on the ghats. They sent back a message of grateful thanks, and I never heard of them afterwards. No doubt their relatives, who knew that their connection with the dacoits was now known, would not let them come. However, I had done all I could, and I have no doubt the women were perfectly satisfied. So you see, my dear, that the Indian bear, small as he is, is an animal which it is as well to leave alone, at any rate when he happens to be up on the side of a hill while you are at the foot. The Paternosters from Among Malay Pirates and Other Stories by G. A. Henty Section 13 And do you really mean that we're to cross by the steamer, Mr. Virtue, while you go over in the seabird? I do not approve of that at all. Fanny, why do you not rebel and say we won't be put ashore? I call it horrid after a fortnight on board this dear little yacht to have to get onto a crowded steamer with no accommodation and lots of seasick women, perhaps, and crying children. You surely cannot be in earnest. Oh, I don't like it any more than you do, Minnie, but as Tom says we had better do it, and my husband agrees with him, I'm afraid we must submit. Do you really think it's quite necessary, Mr. Virtue? Minnie and I are both good sailors, you know, and we would much rather have a little extra tossing about on board the seabird than the discomforts of a steamer. I certainly think that it will be best, Mrs. Grantham. You know very well we would rather have you on board, and that we shall suffer from your loss more than you will by going the other way. But there's no doubt the wind is getting up, and though we don't feel it much here, it must be blowing pretty hard outside. The seabird is a good sea-boat, as anything of her size that floats, but you don't know what it is to be out in anything like a heavy sea in a thirty-tonner. It would be impossible for you to stay on deck, and we should have our hands full, and should not be able to give you the benefit of our society. Personally, I should not mind being out in the seabird in any weather, but I would certainly rather not have ladies on board. 
"'You don't think we should scream or do anything foolish, Mr. Virtue?' Minnie Graham said indignantly. "'Not at all, Miss Graham. Still, I repeat, the knowledge that there are women on board, delightful at other times, does not tend to comfort in bad weather. Of course, if you prefer it, we can put off our start till this puff of wind has blown itself out. It may have dropped before morning. It may last some little time. I don't think myself that it will drop, for the glass has fallen, and I am afraid we may have a spell of broken weather. Oh, now, don't put it off, Mrs. Grantham said. We have only another fortnight before James must be back again in London, and it would be a great pity to lose three or four days, perhaps, and we have been looking forward to cruising about among the Channel Islands, and to St. Mao, and all those places. Oh, no, I, I think the other is much the better plan. That is, if you won't take us with you. It would be bad manners to say that I won't, Mrs. Grantham, but I must say I would rather not. It will be a very short separation. Grantham will take you on shore at once, and as soon as the boat comes back I shall be off. You'll start in the steamer this evening, and get into Jersey at nine or ten o'clock tomorrow morning. And if I am not there before you, I shall not be many hours after you. Well, if it must be, it must, Mrs. Grantham said with an air of resignation. Come, Minnie, let us put a few things into a handbag for tonight. You see, the skipper is not to be moved by our pleadings. This is the worst of you married women, Fanny, Miss Graham said with a little pout. You get into the way of doing as you are ordered. I call it too bad. Here have we been cruising about for the last fortnight with scarcely a breath of wind and longing for a good brisk breeze and a little change in excitement, and now it comes at last and we are to be packed off in a steamer. I call it horrid of you, Mr. Virtue. You may laugh, but I do. Tom Virtue did laugh, but he showed no signs of giving way. And ten minutes later Mr. and Mrs. Grantham and Miss Graham took their places in the gig and were rowed into Southampton Harbour off which the seabird was lying. The last fortnight had been a very pleasant one, and it had cost the owner of the seabird as much as his guests to come to the conclusion that it was better to break up the party for a few hours. Tom Virtue had, up to the age of five and twenty, been possessed of a sufficient income for his wants. He would entered at the bar, not that he felt any particular vocation in that direction, but because he thought it incumbent upon him to do something. Then, at the death of an uncle, he had come into a considerable fortune, and was able to indulge his taste for yachting, which was the sole amusement for which he really cared to the fullest. He sold the little five-tonner he had formerly possessed, and purchased the seabird. He could well have afforded a much larger craft, but he knew that there was far more real enjoyment in sailing to be obtained from a small craft than a large one, for in the latter he would be obliged to have a regular skipper, and would be little more than a passenger, whereas on board the seabird, Although his first hand was dignified by the name of Skipper, he was himself the absolute master. The boat carried the aforesaid Skipper, three hands and a steward, and with them he had twice been up the Mediterranean, across to Norway, and had several times made the circuit of the British Isles. He had unlimited confidence in his boat, and cared not what weather he was out in her. This was the first time since his ownership of her that the Seabird had carried lady passengers, his friend Grantham, an old school and college chum, was a hard-working barrister, and Virtue had proposed to him to take a month's holiday on board the Seabird. "'Put aside your books, old man,' he said. "'You look fagged and overworked. A month's blow will do you all the good in the world.' "'Thank you, Tom. I've made up my mind for a month's holiday, but I can't accept your invitation, though I should enjoy it of all things. But it should not be fair to my wife.' She doesn't get very much of my society, and she's been looking forward to our having a run together, so I must decline. Virtue hesitated a moment. He was not very fond of ladies' society, and thought them especially in the way on board a yacht. But he had a great liking for his friend's wife, and was almost as much at home in his house as in his own chambers. Well, why not bring the wife with you, he said, as soon as his mind was made up. It'll be a nice change for her, too and I have heard her say that she's a good sailor. The accommodation is not extensive, but the after-cabin is a pretty good size, and I would do all I could to make her comfortable. Perhaps she'd like another lady with her. If so, by all means bring one. They could have the after-cabin, you could have the little stateroom, and I could sleep in the saloon. It's very good of you, Tom, especially as I know that it will put you out frightfully, but the offer is a very tempting one. I'll speak to Fanny, and let you have an answer in the morning. 
"'That will be delightful, James,' Mrs. Grantham said, when the invitation was repeated to her. "'I should like it of all things, and I am sure the rest and quiet and the sea air will be just the thing for you. It's wonderful, Tom Virtue, making the offer, and I, I take it as a great personal compliment, for he certainly is not what is generally called a ladies' man. It's very nice, too, of him to think of my having another lady on board. Whom shall I ask? Oh, I know, she said suddenly. That will be the thing of all others. We'll ask my cousin Minnie. She's full of fun in life, and will make a charming wife for Tom. James Grantham laughed. What schemers you all are, Fanny. Now I should call it downright treachery to take anyone on board the seabird with the idea of capturing its master. Nonsense! Treachery! Mrs. Graham said indignantly. Minnie is the nicest girl I know, and it would do Tom a world of good to have a wife to look after him. Why, he's thirty now, and will be settling down into a confirmed old bachelor before long. It's the greatest kindness we could do to him to take Minnie on board, and I'm sure he's the sort of man any girl might fall in love with when she gets to know him. The fact is, he's shy. He never had any sisters, and spends all his time in winter at that horrid club, so that really he has never had any women's society, and even with us he will never come unless he knows we're alone. I call it a great pity, for I don't know a pleasanter fellow than he is. I think it'll be doing him a real service in asking Minnie. So that's settled. I'll sit down and write him a note. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, I suppose, was Tom Virtue's comment when he received Mrs. Grantham's letter, thanking him warmly for the invitation, and saying that she would bring her cousin, Miss Graham, with her, if that young lady was disengaged. As a matter of self-defense, he at once invited Jack Harvey, who was a mutual friend of himself and Grantham, to be of the party. Jack can help Grantham to amuse the women, he said to himself. That will be more in his line than mine. I'll run down to Cowes tomorrow and have a chat with Johnson. We shall want a different sort of stores altogether from those we generally carry, and I suppose we must do her up a bit below. Having made up his mind to the infliction of female passengers, Tom Virtue did it handsomely, and when the party came on board at Ride, they were delighted with the aspect of the yacht below. She had been repainted, the saloon and ladies' cabin were decorated in delicate shades of grey, picked out with gold, and the upholsterer, into whose hands the owner of the seabird had placed her, had done his work with taste and judgment, and the ladies' cabin resembled a little boudoir. "'Why, Tom, I should have hardly known her,' Grantham, who had often spent a day on board the seabird, said. "'I hardly know her myself,' Tom said rather ruefully, but I hope she's all right, Mrs. Grantham, and you and Miss Graham will find everything you want.' "'It is charming,' Mrs. Grantham said enthusiastically. "'It's awfully good of you, Tom, and we appreciate it, don't we, Minnie? "'It is such a surprise, too. "'But James said that, while I should find everything very comfortable, "'I must not expect that a small yacht would be got up like a palace.' "'So a fortnight had passed. "'They had cruised along the coast as far as Plymouth, "'anchoring at night at the various ports on the way. "'Then they would returned to Southampton, "'and it had been settled that as none of the party, "'with the exception of Virtue himself, had been to the Channel Islands, the last fortnight of the trip should be spent there. The weather had been delightful, save that there had been some deficiency in wind, and throughout the cruise the seabird had been under all the sail she could spread. But when the gentlemen came on deck early in the morning a considerable change had taken place. The sky was grey and the clouds flying fast overhead. "'We're going to have dirty weather,' Tom Virtue said at once. "'I don't think it's going to be a gale, but there will be more sea than will be pleasant for the ladies.' I tell you what, Grantham, the best thing will be for you to go on shore with the two ladies and cross by the boat to-night. If you don't mind going directly after breakfast, I'll start at once, and shall be at St. Hilaire's as soon as you are. And so it had been agreed, but not, as has been seen, without opposition and protest on the part of the ladies. Mrs. Grantham's chief reason for objecting had not been given. The little scheme on which she had set her mind seemed to be working satisfactorily, from the first day Tom Virtue had exerted himself to play the part of host satisfactorily, and had ere long shaken off any shyness he may have felt toward the one stranger of the party, and he and Miss Graham had speedily got on friendly terms. So things were going on as well as Mrs. Grantham could have expected. No sooner had his guests left the side of the yacht than her owner began to make his preparations for a start. "'What do you think of the weather, Watkins?' he asked his skipper. 
It's going to blow hard, sir. That's my view of it. And if I was you, I shouldn't up anchor to-day. Still, it's just as you likes. The seabird won't mind it if you don't. She's had a rough time of it before now. Still, it'll be a case of wet jackets, and no mistake. Yes, I expect we shall have a rough time of it, Watkins. But I want to get across. We don't often let ourselves be weather-bound, and I am not going to begin it to-day. We had better house the topmast at once, and get two reefs in the mainsail. We can get the other down when we get clear of the island. Get number three jib up, and the leg of mutton mizzen. Put two reefs in the foresail. Tom and his friend Harvey, who was a good sailor, assisted the crew in reefing down the sails, and a few minutes after the gig had returned and been hoisted in, the yawl was running rapidly down Southampton waters. We need hardly have reefed quite so closely, Jack Harvey said, as he puffed away at his pipe. Not yet, Jack. But you'll see she has as much as she can carry before long. It's all the better to make all snug before starting. It saves a lot of trouble afterwards, and the extra canvas would not have made ten minutes' difference to us at the outside. We shall have pretty nearly a dead beat down the solid. Fortunately, the tide will be running strong with us, but there will be a nasty kick up there. You'll, you'll see we shall feel the short, choppy seas there, more than we shall when we get outside. She's a grand boat in a really heavy sea, but in short waves she puts her nose into it with a will. Now, if you'll take my advice, you'll do as I am going to do. Put on a pair of fishermen's boots and oilskin and sou'wester. There are several sets for you to choose from below. As her owner had predicted, the seabird put her bowsprit under pretty frequently in the solid. The wind was blowing half a gale, and as it met the tide it knocked up a short, angry sea, crested with white heads, and Jack Harvey agreed that she had quite as much sail on her as she wanted. The cabin doors were bolted and all made snug to prevent the water getting below before they got to the race off Hurst Castle, and it was well that they did so, for she was as much under water as she was above. I think if I had given way to the ladies and brought them with us, they would have changed their minds by this time, Jack, Tom Virtue said with a laugh. I should think so, his friend agreed. This is not a day for a fair-weather sailor. Look what a sea is breaking on the shingles. Yes, five minutes there would knock her into matchwood. Another ten minutes, and we shall be fairly out, and I shan't be sorry. One feels as if one was playing football, only just at present the seabird is the ball and the waves, the kickers. Another quarter of an hour, and they passed the needles. That is more pleasant, Jack, as the short chopping motion was exchanged for a regular rise and fall. This is what I enjoy, a steady wind and a regular sea. The seabird goes over it like one of her namesakes. She's not taking a teacup full now over her bows. Watkins, you may as well take the helm for a spell while we go down to lunch. I'm not sorry to give it up for a bit, for it's been jerking like the kick of a horse. That's right, Jack. Hang up your oil skin there. Johnson, give us a couple of towels. We have pretty well smothered up there on deck. Now, what have you got for us? There's some soup ready, sir, and that cold pie you had for dinner yesterday. That will do. Open a couple of bottles of stout. Lunch over, they went on deck again. She likes a good blow as well as we do, Virtue said enthusiastically, as they all rose lightly over each wave. What do you think of it, Watkins? Is the wind going to lull a bit as the sun goes down? I think not, sir. It seems to me it's blowing harder than it was. Then we will prepare for the worst, Watkins. Get the trysail up on deck. When you're ready, we'll bring her up into the wind and set it. That's the comfort of a yawl, Jack. One can always lie to without any bother, and one hasn't got such a tremendous boom to handle. The trysail was soon on deck, and then the seabird was brought up into the wind. The weather foresheet hauled aft, the mizzen sheeted almost fore and aft, and the seabird lay head to wind, rising and falling with a gentle motion, in strong contrast to her impetuous rushes when under sail. She would ride out anything like this, her owner said. Last time we came through the bay on our way from Gibraltar we were caught in a gale strong enough to blow the hair off one's head, and we lay to for nearly three days and didn't ship a bucket of water all the time. Now let us lend a hand to get the mainsail stowed. Ten minutes work and it was securely fastened and its cover on, Two reefs were put in the trysail. Two hands went to each of the halyards, while, as the sail rose, Tom Virtue fastened the toggles round the mast. 
"'All ready, Watkins?' "'All ready, sir.' "'Slack off the weather foresheet, then, and haul aft the leeward. "'Slack off the mizzen sheet a little, Jack. That's it. Now she's off again like a duck.' The seabird felt the relief from the pressure of the heavy boom to leeward, and rose easily and lightly over the waves. Oh, "'She certainly is a splendid seaboat, Tom. I don't wonder you're ready to go anywhere in her. I thought we were rather fools for starting this morning, although I enjoy a good blow. But now I don't care how hard it comes on.' Now, by night it was blowing a downright gale. "'We will lie to till morning, Watkins, so that we get in by daylight to-morrow evening. That's all we want. See, our side-lights are burning well, and you had better get up a couple of blue lights, in case anything comes running up channel. Don't see our lights. We'd better divide into two watches. I'll keep one with Matthews and Dawson. Mr. Harvey will go in your watch with Nichols. We had better get the trysail down altogether.' and lie too under the foresail and mizzen but don't put many lashings on the trysail one will be enough and have it ready to cast off in a moment in case we want to hoist the sail in a hurry i'll go down and have a glass of hot grog first and then i'll take my watch to begin with let the two hands with me go down the steward will serve them out a tot each jack you had better turn in at once virtue was soon on deck again muffled up in his oilskins now, Watkins, you can go below and turn in. I shan't go below to-night, sir, not to lie down. There's nothing much to do here, but I couldn't sleep if I did lie down. Very well. You had better go below and get a glass of grog. Tell the steward to give you a big pipe with a cover like this out of the lock-up. And there's plenty of chewing tobacco if the men are short. I'll take that instead of a pipe, Watkins said. There's nothing like a quid in weather like this, it ain't never in your way, and it lasts. Even with a cover, a pipe would soon be out. Please yourself, Watkins. Tell the other two hands forward to keep a bright lookout for lights. The night passed slowly. Occasionally a sea heavier than usual came on board, curling over the bow and falling with a heavy thud on the deck. But for the most part the seabird breasted the waves easily. The bowsprit had been reefed in to its fullest, thereby adding to the lightness and buoyancy of the boat. Tom Virtue did not go below when his friend came up to relieve him at the change of watch, but sat smoking and doing much talking in the short intervals between the gusts. The morning broke grey and misty, driving sleet came along on the wind, and the horizon was closed in as by a dull curtain. "'How far can we see, do you think, Watkins?' "'Perhaps a couple of miles, sir.' Uh, well, that will be enough. I think we both know the position of every reef to within a hundred yards, so we'll shape our course for Guernsey. If we happen to hit it off, we can hold on to St. Helier, but if, when we think we ought to be within sight of Guernsey, we see nothing of it, we must lie to again till the storm has blown itself out of the clouds lift. It would never do to go groping our way along with such currents as run among the islands. Put the last reef in the trysail before you hoist it. I think you had better get the foresail down altogether, and run up the Spitfire jib. The seabird was soon under way again. Now, Watkins, you take the helm. We'll go down and have a cup of hot coffee, and I'll see that the steward has a good supply for you in the hands. But first, do you take the helm, Jack, whilst Watkins and I have a look at the chart, and try to work out where we are, and the course we had better lie for Guernsey. Five minutes were spent over the chart, then Watkins went above, and Jack Harvey came below. "'You've got the coffee ready, I hope, Johnson?' "'Yes, sir, coffee and chocolate. I didn't know which you'd like.' "'Chocolate, by all means, Jack. I recommend the chocolate. Bring two full-sized bowls, Johnson, and put that cold pie on the table. Oh, and a couple of knives and forks, never mind about a cloth. But first of all, bring a couple of basins of hot water. We shall enjoy our food more after a wash.' The early breakfast was eaten, dry coats and mufflers put on, pipes lighted, and they went up upon deck. Tom took the helm. "'What time do you calculate we ought to make Guernsey, Tom?' "'About twelve. The wind is freer than it was, and we're walking along at a good pace. Matthews, cast the log, and let's see what we're doing. About seven knots, I should say.' Seven and a quarter, sir,' the man said, when he checked the line. "'Not a bad guess, Tom.' It's always difficult to judge pace in a heavy sea. At eleven o'clock the mist ceased. 
Well, that's fortunate, Tom Virtue said. I shouldn't be surprised if we get a glimpse of the sun between the clouds presently. Will you get my sextant and the chronometer up, Jack, and put them handy? Jack Harvey did as he was asked, but there was no occasion to use the instruments, for ten minutes later Watkins, who was standing near the bow, gazing fixedly ahead, shouted, "'There's Guernsey, sir, on our lee bow, about six miles away, I should say.' "'Well, that's it, short enough,' Tom agreed, as he gazed in the direction in which Watkins was pointing. "'There's a gleam of sunshine on it, or we shouldn't have seen it yet. "'Yes, I think you're about right as to the distance. "'Now let us take its bearings. We may lose it again directly.' Having taken the bearings of the island, they went below and marked off their position on the chart, and they shaped their course for Cape Grosnay, the northwestern point of Jersey. The gleam of sunshine was transient. The clouds closed in again overhead, darker and grayer than before. Soon the drops of rain came flying before the wind, the horizon closed in, and they could not see half a mile away. But though the sea was heavy, the seabird was making capital weather of it, and the two friends agreed that, after all, the excitement of a sail like this was worth a month of pottering about in calms. "'We must keep a bright look at presently,' the skipper said. "'There are some nasty rocks off the coast of Jersey. We must give them a wide berth. We'd best make round to the south of the island and lie to there till we can pick up a pilot to take us into St. Helier. I don't think it'll be worth while trying to get into St. Aubin's Bay by ourselves.' I think so, too, Watkins, but we will see what it's like before it gets dark. If we can pick up a pilot, all the better. If not, we'll lie to till morning, if the weather keeps thick. But if it clears so that we can make out all the lights, we ought to be able to get into the bay anyhow. An hour later the rain ceased, and the sky appeared somewhat clearer. Suddenly Watkins exclaimed, "'There's a wreck, sir, there, three miles away to leeward. She's on the Paternosters.' "'Good heavens! She's a steamer!' Tom exclaimed as he caught sight of her the next time the seabird lifted on a wave. "'Can she be the Southampton boat, do you think?' "'Like enough, sir. She may have had it thicker than we had, and may not have calculated enough for the current. "'Up helm, Jack, and bear away towards her. Shall we shake out a reef, Watkins?' "'Oh, I wouldn't, sir. She's got as much as she can carry on her now. We must mind what we are doing, sir. The currents run like a mill-stream.' and if we get that reef under our lee and the wind and current both setting us on to it, it'll be all up with us in no time. Yes, I know that, Watkins. Jack, take the helm a minute while we run down and look at the chart. Our only chance, Watkins, is to work up behind the reef, and try and get so that they can either fasten a line to a buoy and let it float down to us, or get into a boat, if they have one left, and drift to us. "'There are an awful lot of rocks out there,' Watkins said, as they examined the chart. "'You see, some of them show merely at high tide, and a lot of them are above at low water. "'It'll be an awful business to get among them rocks, sir. "'Just about as near certain death as a thing can be.' "'Well, it's got to be done, Watkins,' Tom said firmly. "'I see the danger as well as you do, but whatever the risk, it must be tried. "'Mr. Grantham and the two ladies went on board by my persuasion.' and I should never forgive myself if anything happened to them. But I will speak to the men. He went on deck and called the men to him. Look here, lads. You see that steamer ashore on the Paternosters. In such a sea as this she may go to pieces in half an hour. I am determined to make an effort to save the lives of those on board. As you can see for yourselves, there is no lying to weather of her, with the current and wind driving us on to the reef. We must beat up from behind. Now, lads, the sea there is full of rocks, and the chances are ten to one we strike onto them and go to pieces. But anyhow, I am going to try. But I won't take you unless you're willing. The boat's a good one, and the zinc chambers will keep her afloat if she fills. Well managed, you ought to be able to make the coast of Jersey in it. Mr. Harvey, Watkins, and I can handle the yacht, so you can take the boat if you like. The men replied that they would stick to the yacht, wherever Mr. Virtue chose to take her, and muttered something about the ladies, for the pleasant faces of Mrs. Grantham and Miss Graham had, during the fortnight they'd been on board, won the men's hearts. "'Very well, lads. I'm glad to find you'll stick by me. If we pull safely through it, I'll give each of you three months' wages. Now set to work with a will and get the gig out. We'll tow her after us, and take to her if we make a smash of it.' 
They were now near enough to see the white breakers, in the middle of which the ship was lying. She was fast breaking up. The jagged outline showed that the stern had been beaten in. The masts and funnel were gone, and the waves seemed to make a clean breach over her, almost hiding her from sight in a white cloud of spray. "'Wood and iron can't stand that much longer,' Jack Harvey said. "'Another hour, and I should say there won't be two planks left together.' "'It is awful, Jack. I'd give all I have in the world if I'd not persuaded them to go on board. Keep her off a little more, Watkins.' The seabird passed within a cable's length of the breakers at the northern end of the reef. "'Now, lads, take your places at the sheets, ready to haul or let go as I give the word.' So saying, Tom Virtue took his place in the bow, holding on by the forestay. The wind was full on the seabird's beam as she entered the broken water. Here and there the dark heads of the rocks showed above water. These were easy enough to avoid. The danger lay in those hidden beneath its surface, and whose position was indicated only by the occasional break of a sea as it passed over them. Every time the seabird sank on a wave, those on board involuntarily held their breaths. But the water here was comparatively smooth, the sea having spent its first force upon the outer reef. With a wave of his hand Tom directed the helmsman as to his course, and the little yacht was admirably handled through the dangers. "'I begin to think we shall do it,' Tom said to Jack Harvey, who was standing close to him. "'Another five minutes, and we shall be within reach of her.' It could be seen now that there was a group of people clustered in the bow of the wreck. Two or three light lines were coiled in readiness for throwing. "'Now, Watkins,' Tom said, going aft, "'make straight for the wreck. I see no broken water between us and them, and possibly there may be deep water under their bow.' It was an anxious moment, as with the sails flattened in the all forged up nearly in the eye of the wind towards the wreck. Her progress was slow, for she was now stemming the current. Tom stood with a coil of line in his hand in the bow. "'You get ready to throw, Jack, if I miss.' Nearer and nearer the yacht approached the wreck, until the bowsprit of the latter seemed to stand almost over her. Then Tom threw the line. It fell over the bowsprit, and a cheer broke from those on board the wreck, and from the sailors of the seabird. A stronger line was at once fastened to that throne, and to this a strong hawser was attached. "'Down with the helm, Watkins. Now, lads, lower away the trysail as fast as you can.' Now, one of you, clear that hawser as they haul on it. Now, out with the anchors. These had been got into readiness, and it was not thought that they would get any hold on the rocky bottom. Still, they might catch on a projecting ledge, and at any rate their weight and that of the chain cable would relieve the strain upon the hawser. Two sailors had run out on the bowsprit of the wreck as soon as the line was thrown, and the end of the hawser was now on board the steamer. Thank God! There's Grantham! Jack Harvey exclaimed. Do you see him waving his hand? "'I see him,' Tom said, "'but I, I don't see the ladies.' "'They are there, no doubt,' Jack said confidently, "'crouching down, I expect. "'He would not be there if they weren't, you may be sure. "'Yes, there they are, those two muffled-up figures. "'There one of them has thrown back a cloak and is waving her arm.' "'The two young men waved their caps. "'Are the anchors holding, Watkins? "'There's a tremendous strain on that hawser. "'I think so, sir. "'They are both tight. "'Put them round the windlass and give a turn or two. "'We must relieve the strain on that hawser.' Since they had first seen the wreck, the waves had made great progress in the work of destruction, and the steamer had broken in two, just aft of the engines. "'Get over the spare spars, Watkins, and fasten them to float in front of her bows like a triangle. Matthews, catch hold of that boat-hook and try to fend off any piece of timber that comes along. You get hold of the sweeps, lads, and do the same. They would stave her in like a nutshell if they struck her. Thank God, here comes the first of them.' Those on board the steamer had not been idle. As soon as the yawl was seen approaching, slings were prepared, and no sooner was the hawser securely fixed than the slings were attached to it, and a woman placed in them. The hawser was tight and the descent sharp, and without a check the figure ran down to the deck of the seabird. She was lifted out of the slings by Tom and Jack Harvey, who found she was an old woman and had entirely lost consciousness. Two of you carry her below. Tell Johnson to pour a little brandy down her throat. Give us some hot soup as soon as she comes, too. Another woman was lowered and helped below. The next to descend was Mrs. Grantham. Thank God you are rescued, Tom said, as he helped her out of the sling. Thank God, indeed, Mrs. Grantham, and thank you all. Oh, Tom, we've had a terrible time of it, and had lost all hope till we saw your sail, and even then the captain said that he was afraid nothing could be done. Minnie was the first to make out it was you, and then we began to hope. 
She's been so brave, dear girl. Ah, here she comes. But Minnie's firmness came to an end, and now that she felt the need for it was over, she was unable to stand when she was lifted from the slings, and Tom carried her below. Are there any more women, Mrs. Grantham? No, there's only one other lady passenger and the stewardess. Then you had better take possession of your own cabin. I ordered Johnson to spread a couple more mattresses and some bedding on the floor, so you'll all four be able to turn in. There's plenty of hot coffee and soup. I should advise soup with two or three spoonfuls of brandy in it. Now, excuse me, I must go upon deck. Twelve men descended by the hawser, one of them with both legs broken by the fall of the mizzen. The last to come was the captain. "'Is that all?' Tom asked. "'That is all,' the captain said. Six men were swept overboard when she first struck, and two were killed by the fall of the funnel. Fortunately, we had only three gentlemen passengers and three ladies on board. The weather looked so wild when we started that no one else cared about making the passage. "'God bless you, sir, for what you have done. Another half-hour, and it would have been all over with us. But it seems like a miracle you are getting safe through the rocks to us.' "'It was fortunate indeed that we came along,' Tom said. Three of the passengers are dear friends of mine, and, as it was by my persuasion that they came across in the steamer instead of in the yacht, I should never have forgiven myself if they had been lost. Take all your men below, Captain. You will find plenty of hot soup there. Now, Watkins, let us be off. That steamer won't hold together many minutes longer, so there's no time to lose. We'll go back as we came. Give me a hatchet. Now, lads, two of you stand at the chain cables. Knock out the shackles the moment I cut the hawser. Watkins, you take the helm and let her head pay off till the jib fills. Jack, you lend a hand to the other two and get up the trysail again as soon as we're free. In a moment all were at their stations. The helm was put on the yacht, and she paid off on the opposite tack to that on which she had before been sailing. As soon as the jib filled, Tom gave two vigorous blows with his hatchet on the hawser, and as he lifted his hand for a third it parted. Then came the sharp rattle of the chains as they ran round the hawser holes. The trysail was hoisted and sheeted home, and the seabird was under way again. Tom, as before, conned the ship from the bow. Several times she was in close proximity to the rocks, but each time she avoided them. A shout of gladness rose from all on deck as she passed the last patch of white water. Then she tacked and bore away to Jersey. Tom had no time to go down below and look after his passengers. They consisted of the captain and two sailors, the sole survivors of those who had been on deck when the vessel struck, three male passengers, and six engineers and stokers. "'I have not had time to shake you by the hand before, Tom,' Grantham said, as Tom Virtue entered, "'and I thought you would not want me on deck at present. God bless you, old fellow. We all owe you our lives.' "'How did it happen, Captain?' Tom asked, as the captain also came up to him. "'It was the currents, I suppose,' the captain said. "'It was so thick we could not see a quarter of a mile any way. "'The weather was so wild I would not put into Guernsey, "'and pass the island without seeing it. "'I steered my usual course, but the gale must have altered the current, "'for I thought I was three miles away from the reef "'when we saw it on our beam not a hundred yards away. "'It was too late to avoid it then, "'and in another minute we ran upon it, "'and the waves were sweeping over us. "'Everyone behaved well.' I got all, except those who had been swept overboard or crushed by the funnel, up into the bow of the ship, and there we waited. There was nothing to be done. No boat would live for a moment in the sea on that reef, and all I could advise was that when she went to pieces, everyone should try to get hold of a floating fragment. But I doubt whether a man would have been alive a quarter of an hour after she went to pieces. Perhaps, Captain, you'll come on deck with me and give me the benefit of your advice. My skipper and I know the islands pretty well, but no doubt you know them a good deal better, and I don't want another mishap. But the seabird avoided all further dangers, and, as it became dark, the lights of St. Helier's were in sight, and an hour later the yacht brought up in the port and landed her involuntary passengers. A fortnight afterwards the seabird returned to England, and two months later Mrs. Grantham had the satisfaction of being present at the ceremony which was the successful consummation of her little scheme in inviting Minnie Graham to be her companion on board the Seabird. "'Well, my dear,' her husband said, when she indulged in a little natural triumph, "'I do not say that it has not turned out well, and I am heartily glad for both Tom and Minnie's sake it has so. 
but you must allow that it very nearly had a very disastrous ending, and I think if I were you I should leave matters to take their natural course in future. I have accepted Tom's invitation for the same party to take a cruise in the seabird next summer, but I have bargained that next time a storm is brewing up we shall stop quietly in port. That's all very well, James, Mrs. Grantham said saucily, but you must remember that Tom Virtue will only be first mate of the seabird in future. That I shall be able to tell you better, my dear, after our next cruise, all husbands are not as docile and easily led as I am. 